If you're following me, you are definitely a geek, a technology, someone who's interested in things, connecting them, having information from them, and so on. Chances are you've been playing around with home automation, building your own mm. system with home assistant, um, mix and matching with digital assistants, uh, with Zigbee and Z-Wave and Bluetooth low energy or Wi-Fi devices. Uh, you've been tuning things in on Tuya and smart things or other solutions like that. Home automation is still a big mess, at least from my perspective, and it's far from being democratized. Let's see with Shane on the IoT show, what his last 20 plus years experience has been, what he resorted to do to make sure that he has a stable working system at home, as well as geek out a little on where things are going, where things are at, and um, what it will take to democratize home automation. And don't forget, subscribe to the channel, get notified when new episodes come up, and uh, well, let us know what you think in a comment. Hi everyone, this is the IoT Show, I'm Olivia, your host. Today we want to talk about home automation, you know, and uh, I think the main question we're going to try and answer, Shane and I, is, is home automation something that is for everyone, or is it just for us geeky engineers? So Shane, thanks a lot for coming today on the show, how are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad, uh, it's good to see you again. Definitely, you came already to discuss similar topic, but now you advanced in your adventure and your journey in building a home automation system, and you have more and more opinions, which is great. That's what we want. Um, before we get in there, for people who don't know you, tell me a bit about yourself. Who are you? Where are you calling from? What do you do? Who am I? Where do I come from? And what do I do? Well, look, Olivia, like you said, you know, always be learning, continuing to evolve. So look, um, you know, just for our audience here, a bit of our context, I met Olivia, made a journey together at Microsoft. But look, I have, uh, I've worked for other hyperscalers, uh, some of the most progressive tech orgs in Australia. So yes, I am from Australia. Don't take that against me. Uh, along with organizations around the world. But I think most importantly, for the context of this conversation, uh, I've been tinkering with home automation for probably 20 plus years now. Definitely let the smoke out along the way, changed a few dip packages on PLCs and boards along the way. Um, it is night and day from when I started. You know, it's got a lot easier. It's not perfect. And I think, we'll, you know, we'll dive into that a little bit uh, yep. further in this conversation. Um, and what I like to do is every month I try to package up something and write a little blog post about it with a full end-to-end -end example. So that's my journey. Okay. Well, we'll add the link to your blog down there. So Shane, tell me a little bit, for those who are not familiar with home automation, what is the landscape looking like these days, today? Like 2024, you want to automate your home. What are the yeah. things anyone can expect to be able to do? You can expect to be able to do almost anything today, right? It's almost mm -hmm. limitless. However, there is a relationship between complexity and usability and reliability, right? They are all kind of play together. Just to give you some context to where we are today, right? So my house has evolved. Uh, today, it has around 120 bits of digital and analog IO, so sensors, uh, as well as a lot of Tasmoda devices. I'm using Tasmoda. It's an after-source firmware for ESP devices. I've moved off X10, if any of our audience listening today, watching today, uh, has been doing this for a while. They may be familiar with X10. It's, uh, it's horrible and unreliable. Um, it's constantly evolving, right? You know, I'm using a PLC, I'm running an Alan Bradley, an Arduino plus a home, assist, home assistant. That's kind of my setup along with like a 42 RU and almost 10 RU worth of patching, right? So, yeah. you know, what can people expect today? You can expect to achieve almost anything. Is it going to work straight up and be reliable? Probably not, right? You're going to have to have, you know, a bit of an understanding in either C++ or YAML or be, you know, good with the soldering iron. Yeah. So it, I guess the people who are watching this, people are engineers, they understand technology. So they can imagine themselves starting tinkering with Home Assistant and other technologies. And we'll, we'll dive a bit deeper into all of that. But there still is, you know, a huge amount of people out there who are not technologists. Do they have solutions? Like, do you, are there things that you would say, you know, are available and 
possible to use for someone who's not in tech or for someone who doesn't want to bring work at home and just wants something that is plug and play just works and is controllable through an assistant or something, right? This is possible today. A hundred percent, right? You know, the basics, things like Google Nest, uh, you know, Amazon Alexa, uh, they weren't around when I started. Um, they're low friction. Mm-hmm. And they do a lot of stuff. I kind of think of these as like Lego Duplo, right? They're pre-packaged. You can do basic things. Alexa, turn on device, right? It's kind of cute, um, but you can't accomplish that much. And look, in my house today, we have approximately you know 11 Alexa devices. They play their part, right? So we use them for, you know, my kids will say, you know, Alexa, turn off lamp or whatever it is. But mm-hmm. you can also add to them by injecting, you know, via Alexa's API. You can, you can send messages to them and do things like that. So yes, you can accomplish a fair degree, but I would like to, I'd like to say it's probably basic levels of automation. Is it fair to say as well that um, there are still world gardens, right? You, you will go with an ecosystem that would be a Samsung one. It would be eventually, you know, now Google is getting into that with Nest, Amazon, you know, as well. Um, things work well when you stay in that ecosystem, but now as soon as you want to start mix and matching, you know, you have bridges, so you can integrate with one or other of the assistants. Um, but, but is it playing really nice or like, do you see things that end up not working or that end up disconnecting? Or I know Tuya is a good example of things that are coming from, from China a platform that is used by many manufacturers out there using Wi-Fi mainly for uh, connectivity. I've been playing around with some of these light bulbs and you set them up in Tuya and then you do the connection with Google Assistant or with Home Assistant. Mm-hmm. Things kind of work um, yeah. until they don't, right? I think it's interesting, you know, what you just said there. And I let out a bit of a chuckle because Tuya is a really good example of that, right? So Toya, uh, you know, it's a proprietary system used, as you said, you know, white labeled by a lot of manufacturers. Um, and it is, you know, that walled garden, you know, it sits within that ecosystem. And it's interesting to see what the community has done with Toya Local. So rather than leveraging the cloud, going into the Toya cloud, kind of, well, not kind of, running local Toya servers to emulate that as part of platforms like Home Assistant. So they've kind of taken control of what effectively is a good, you know, a, a pretty capable product, but to be able to remove that walled garden. But yes, you know, there, there are walled gardens which limit capabilities. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I use Tasmoda primarily, Tasmoda and MQTT uh, as kind of a pattern for switching and for PowerPoints, GPOs, general purpose outlets and light switches in my house. I evaluated a platform called CBUS. Now, you may not be familiar with CBUS. It's a Schneider electrical product. I'm sure you've heard of Schneider. Uh, and it is that walled garden. You know, it's reliable. Uh, you know, it does a lot of great things, but it's very limited because, you know, it's not an open system. We're talking, you know, closed systems here and it's limiting the ability for, I guess, innovation and my imagination to be able to build, you know, open, complicated systems. Some of the solutions you mentioned, like Schneider would be someone targeting enterprise customers mostly, right? So they want something that is very robust. They want something that's that because customers are paying a huge amount of money for that. Um, and that that's that's going to have to be super robust. And so they will obviously not open everything up to make sure that things really work well. And and I know here, you know, open source fans, I, I'm one of them, will jump on my throat saying, yeah, well, open source doesn't mean unstable. Um, but, but at the end of the day, you know, closed solutions, wall gardens give you that level of reliability and, and robustness, right? 100%. So if we look at the context of CBUS, right, it is, um, it's a control protocol that you will use for switches, et cetera. But it runs a proprietary, you know, low voltage network. So every device has a cable on this dedicated network. It's reliable. You know, mm-hmm. it, it works. It works well. It, but it's trading off, um, you know, usability and, you know, interoperability with other systems in order to be able to give that. So, yes, you know, definitely trade offs here.
Yeah. So, Jane, I would like for, for you to walk us through what you would describe are the, the essential components of a home automation system. And, and what are the technologies you've been investigating, one or two for each of these components? And, so, and sometimes what the shortcomings have been in your 20 something yeah. years of experience building your home automation system. All right. So look, I think I'd like to categorize this into, into two buckets. Broadly, things that no one will really get upset about if they stop working, you know, and things people will get upset about. So my house, you know, it can't be a science experiment. So it needs to work. It needs to work all the time and it needs to look like a house, like a house. Yep. So in that case, we have things like we've got ducted heating, you know, ducted HVAC uh, return airs with Wi-Fi access points hidden in there, you know, power over Ethernet, uh, Cisco things that, you know, hidden looks like a house, right? Yeah. Um, so for example, if you turn a light on by walking into a room and a sensor picks you up and says, hey, you know, the lux level's too low and that doesn't work and the light doesn't magically turn on, it's probably not a big deal. Someone can press a switch and away you go, right? And But for things that can't fail, e.g. doors won't open to get into the house, if you do not have another physical control plane and you know, a garage door's not going to open or an exit door's not going to be able to you know, electronically unlock, that's a big deal, right? So yeah. for, for things that can't fail, I use a PLC and a microcontroller in okay. my house. I have huge admiration uh, for the Arduino platform. So my pattern is I have an Allen Bradley PLC, super reliable. You like just, it just works and works and yeah. works and works. That, that's uh, industrial grade. That's something that works in factory floors and yeah. you know, uh, that's, that, that has to work. It has to work, exactly. And I have a, I have an alarm system called an inner range, which in Australia and New Zealand are like the Cisco systems of, uh, building control, you know, it drives elevators. It has, uh, you know, it can have 65,536 users. It drives all the hid, you know, electronic door locks in the house. And that has a RS-232 link between the PLC and itself. And it has that kind of event bus of what's happening with all the different motion sensors and doors in the house. Um, but I came to the point, and this is where I segue to Arduino, is they're expensive. They really, really, really are expensive. Expansion's expensive. Um, and I started initially thinking, how can I expand the I.O. capabilities? This was before Home Assistant was a thing. Um, how can I expand the I.O. capabilities cost effectively? So initially, I built my own interface, and then it started off as, well, maybe I could run the Arduino as an I squared C slave device, which is a, you know, a protocol. Um, for eventually embracing MQTT. So okay. my pattern today is the Alan Bradley plus an Arduino Mega with all the different bits of IO and serial buses all plugged into it for things that cannot fail, absolutely can't fail. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got Home Assistant, which I think is an amazing uh, piece of technology. It is the new normal. Um, and that's dealing with systems that can fail. Now, broadly speaking, Home Assistant is reliable, but it does need to be, you know, watered and fed. You know, there's operating system updates, there's constant Home Assistant updates. And, you know, and when they're rebooting, things aren't available, right? So um, that's kind of, you know, categorized, you know, the essential components. So that for me is Home Assistant, I think is kind of essential. However, if you need to bring your home automation journey to a new dimension of reliability, you probably need to augment Home Assistant with something else as well. So, Shane, I was curious to know, 20-something years of experience building your own automation system, in these various components that all include a level of connectivity or different radio, wireless, wired, whatnot, um, and you know, hubs for connecting these devices and cloud part if you want to remotely control your home or whatnot, you mentioned shortcomings. You mentioned things that fail and things that you don't want to fail. And you resorted to DIY or create your own bits and pieces for things that cannot fail. What are the shortcomings you're seeing in products that are available out there? What did you see fail 
like in your experience? Yeah. Okay. So you could probably categorize this from protocol level through to user error. Look, I think on the protocol level, Zigbee has been very hit and miss for myself, considering the fact it runs on the same uh, frequency band as Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz. I have a house full of Cisco uh, Aeronet, you know, uh, industrial access points, four of them mm -hmm. that power this joint in a bit of a mesh. And, you know, my journey when I upgraded them from, I upgraded my switching from PoE to PoE plus, and these access points went into a bit of a high power mode, it broke my Zigbee network. All right? oh, yeah. So, you know, that, that challenge of interference between devices operating, particularly wireless devices, has been a challenge in terms of reliability as well, which is why I always favor a cable where, where possible. Mm -hmm. uh, on the user level side, and I think, you know, from, it's not just home automation, it's code in general, increased complexity. So the, you know, my Arduino sketch is over 4,000 lines long these days. You know, there's a lot going on. You yeah. can do a lot in 32K, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot going on and sometimes you can get lost in that complexity, right? So what I've seen failing is, maybe I won't call it failing, just a lack of visibility into what is going on in complicated systems. And, and as a matter of fact, you need to integrate all these moving parts because what you want is a single pane of glass to control. You need you a single pane have, of glass. Yeah, you want to have interoperability, right? And you were, you were describing some scenarios, crazy scenarios of like security cameras and locks on the doors that all combine uh, around rules that you set. But you need to have one, one system that will be able to monitor and control everything right at once or in a way or another right and i was wondering you know if you have an opinion regarding how can this interoperability happen you know we talked about wall gardens where things are working really well when you stay in one ecosystem but as soon as you start mingling different ecosystems different radios you know it just talked about yeah. zb versus wi-fi the reality is that you will have devices using different communication channels using different types of hubs um, talking to different clouds. What, what is the solution from your perspective to reconcile all of that? Well, that is absolutely essential. So I'd like to think I'm at that place now where all of my systems, all of my key systems from Home Assistant through to the Arduino, through to the PLC, all have an understanding of what is happening in each other's words, worlds. They can reference sensors, you know, things and, you know, instruct events to happen. So we absolutely need that democratization, um, you know, to be able to flatten things out. So for me, that is MQTT in uh -huh. my house here. So my MQTT bus does around two and a half messages per second, which is a fair bit. If you add that up over the course of a day, it's around 20,000 events that are, you know, flicking uh, over that MQTT bus. It needs to happen, be it MQTT or another protocol out there. There needs to be a way to flatten and democratize. So it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if, you know, if we think about the OSI layer as an example, it doesn't matter at the physical sense if it is matter or if it is Zigbee or if it is, you know, uh, IP, it doesn't matter, right? Like you're sending a message and it implements a higher level abstraction, which take care of the lower level. Yeah, interesting. And I think the debate, there should be a debate if it's not already on in terms of what is that level? Because you say MQTT on your side, to me, MQTT is really more of a, it's a, it's a pop sub mechanism, right? It's like, a, like, it's not opinionated in terms of what's in the messages, what's the structure, what not. I, I like, since, since I've been working on, on the notion of digital twins, yeah. I like this idea of having a way to describe capabilities interfaces um so that and relationships so that way you you can have entities described and describing themselves mm. through uh this model that will allow you to then have an entire system you know with different entities being able to interact because they will discover each other they will understand what capabilities each other have uh and then you will be able to set up rules on top of that right and so 
the, the, the underlying layer, the communication layer, to me is is maybe one level below where the conversation is to have because yeah like you can you have different ways of communicating down there it could be thread could be mqtt could be whatever um the question is more you know how do you describe is there a universal way to describe a dimmer a universal way to describe a lock is there a universal way to describe a, a an led bulb and and if if not you know, how do you reconcile? How do you interpret if you're not if you're not speaking the same language, basically? Uh, that's a great question. And I, I think we've come a long way, but we're not there at the moment. You're right. So abstraction has gone from here to mm -hmm. here. But realistically, we need that. We need to lift the low water bar of capabilities for everyone. So if a, you add that dimmer into your environment, that it's not just a, in, you know, in my example here, it's not just an MQTT message with, you know, a payload to turn on or off or to report yeah, your yeah. level, et cetera. But you're reporting back, hey, I'm a dimmer. Um, these are my capabilities and everything can just, you know, use this. Yeah. We're not there as yet. We're not but there. We're you did implement that for yourself, right? On top of MQTT, you're saying you have MQTT, but you defined a set of topics and structure to the messages for yourself, right? In your own code. Yeah, so I do, but you know, you are correct in, it's not standardized. If I look at the payloads and some of these MQTT messages from various devices, some of them are sending raw data. Some of them are sending JSON structured payloads with, you know, vast amounts of data. It's not consistent. And you yeah. can't do a system with consistency when mm -hmm. you know, the base level is just, you know, it's just the, the basics here, right? Yeah, so you mentioned Home Assistant several times. Um, it's an open source project that is trying to, to propose, you know, a level of abstraction with connectors for different systems out there. There's like a, hundreds of them when you add the, the different connectors in Home Assistant. So that's an interesting opinionated way of doing things. Uh, it's very JSON heavy in terms of describing you know the models and so on so that's pretty interesting matter is a industry driven standard has been defined by like some of the the various bigger uh, mm. bigger player in that space so to me matter is going to be um it's going to matter yeah uh i sorry like i i promised myself i wouldn't do the pun but uh i couldn't help so yeah, I think we're, we're getting somewhere there. Uh, it's still complicated, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, we still need our own little Shane available with their blog to tell You're us, right. you know, what to do and how to do it. It's still a geek world. Um, hopefully, one day it's going to become more democratized, and 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 maybe you know, as I don't know, we we'll say that, but uh, you know, like any other technology, uh, good technology should be as close as possible to magic or transparent, right? And so home automation is one of these things. It has to work. You shouldn't yeah. be tinkering with it for making it work. Well, I'll give you a really good example. I was at a, I was at a, a scout, a Cub Scout event on Friday night. And, you know, one of the other dads came up to me and said, hey, Shane, um, I want to automate. I've got all these solar panels on my roof. I want to automate when my pool pump, you know, turns on and off based on uh, PV generation. Simple mm -hmm. enough for someone yeah, yeah. like myself, you know. I, uh, I've heard of Home Assistant. What do we need to do? And I think, you know, I thought about this, right? And I think the reality is Home Assistant is great. You know, you might buy a device, but you still need to have that basic level of YAML understanding, you know. Yeah. I live in the configuration.yaml file in Home Assistant because the GUI is so limited, right? It's... Like we are getting better. Like I wonder what this will look like in the next five or ten years, and maybe matter plays a part. But you know, the the true test would be, you know, could that dad sort out his own pool pump with a solar array, and this person and this individual, uh, you know, writes articles. He's a motorcycle test writer. So mm -hmm. someone with zero level of IT automation skills be able to solve this. Yeah. And I don't think, unfortunately, you know, we are quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I'm with you 200%. And you need to have, you need to have, you know, safeguards. You need to have the manual interface working. Um, my, my house is everything can, can work automatically. My wife and kids, they are not really interested in doing that. They're just like saying, hey, dad, I just want to hit the, 
the switch yeah. to turn the light on. I'm just like, but you can turn like the three of them at once. And they're just like, I don't care. <laughs> That's interesting. Anyways, so Shane, um, for people to find you, we'll bring your blog down there because you have like lots of tips and tricks. If people want to also share their own experience with, uh, you know, the oh. state of the art in home automation, they're welcome to comment down here. 100%. Look, and I love hearing, uh, you know, from the community. I had someone leave a comment the other week that, you know, I thought I'd done this amazing stuff. And they're like, oh, by the way, you know, if you do this as well, and sure enough, you know, looking at, you know, sending a 12 volt trigger to these two pins would do this. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. So, you know, we're all learning. We're all on a journey here together. Exactly. I'm actually uh, teasing a little bit here. I'm playing around with this little, oh. uh, little Arduino Nano Matter device. It's a little uh, development board. So I'm, I'm doing my first um matter development right now with this one that's pretty cool actually if you want to check it out a usb powered you know as uh as this matter connectivity or or protocol support out of the box tons of ios so you like can hook up a relay hook up a bunch yeah. of you know sensors on that uh so i'll uh i'll start playing around with that and uh, we'll report over over, uh, over the blog over linkedin i guess for sure. Look, I think matter is going to play, you know, a really important part on, dare I say, reducing the reliance on cloud services. You know, we talk about, you know, reliability, the things that run locally seem to just work and be more reliable. You know, this is the uh, family approval rating. If a door needs to open and it's got to, it's got to go, you know, through my local gateway, through yeah. fiber, out into the cloud, you know, and then all the way to come back, you know, there is more links in the chain that ultimately will, you know, go wrong, right? So it is things like Matter, it is things like Home Assistant that are advancing and driving that conversation further. Yeah, yeah, totally. Awesome. Shane, well, thanks a lot for your time today. Hope people enjoy the conversation. Let's continue talking autom automation then. Let's comment, let's engage here. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I will just say to people, look, open your mind. Uh, you know, building, building is for everyone. Have a play, you know, let the smoke out. You will learn something. Uh, but don't let it out too often. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, one more thing, like you might not be an engineer, but home automation could be your tinkering projects for the weekend where you learn technology while having fun automating yeah. your house. You, just, you know, just to finally close up here. You know, as you're tinkering with an Arduino, go out, buy an Arduino, have a play with Home Assistant, you know, get your hands dirty. The The barrier to entry is really, really low these days uh, and you'd be surprised in what you can do. Yeah, awesome. Shane, thanks all for your time. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. All right.